3. Periodic Confusion The Emergence of Complexity Chapter 8. From Physics to Biology Technetium, Neptunium, Phosphorus Glenn Seaborg and Al Jorso brought the hunt for unknown elements to a new level of sophistication. But they were hardly the only scientists inking in new spaces on the periodic table. In fact, when Time magazine named 15 U.S. scientists its Men of the Year for 1960, it selected as one of the honorees not Seaborg or Jorso, but the greatest element craftsman of an earlier era a man who'd nabbed the most slippery and elusive element on the entire table while Seaborg was still in graduate school. Emilio Segre. In an attempt to look futuristic, the cover for the issue shows a tiny, throbbing red nucleus. Instead of electrons, it is surrounded by fifteen headshots, all in the same sober, stilted poses familiar to anyone who's ever snickered over the teacher's spread in a yearbook. The lineup included geneticists, astronomers, laser pioneers, and cancer researchers, as well as a mugshot of William Shockley, the jealous transistor scientist and future eugenicist. Even in this issue, Shockley couldn't help but expound on his theories of race. Despite the class picture feel, it was an illustrious crew, and time made the selections to crow about the sudden international dominance of American science. In the first four decades of the Nobel Prize through 1940, U.S. scientists won 15 prizes. In the next 20 years, they won 42. Authors note, besides Segre, Shockley, and Pauling, the other 12 scientists on the cover of Time were George Beadle, Charles Draper, John Enders, Donald Glazer, Joshua Lederberg, Willard Libby, Edward Purcell, Isidore Rabi, Edward Teller, Charles Towns, James Van Allen, and Robert Woodward. The Time Men of the Year article contained the following words by Shockley on race. He meant them as complimentary, obviously, but his view on Bunch had to have sounded weird even at the time, and in retrospect, it's creepy. William Shockley, 50, is that rare breed of scientist, a theorist who makes no apology for a consuming interest in the practical applications of his work. Asking how much of a research job is pure and how much applied, says Shockley, is like asking how much Negro and white blood Ralph Bunch might have. What's important is that Ralph Bunch is a great man. The article also shows that the legend about Shockley as the main inventor of the transistor was already firmly established. Hired by Bell Telephone Laboratories right after he graduated from MIT in 1936, Theoretical physicist Shockley was one of a team that found a use for what had previously been a scientific parlor stunt, the use of silicon and germanium as a photoelectric device. Along with his partners, Shockley won a Nobel Prize for turning hunks of germanium into the first transistors, the educated little crystals that are fast replacing vacuum tubes in the country's booming electronics industry. Segre, who as an immigrant and a Jew also reflected the importance of World War II refugees to America's sudden scientific dominance, was among the older of the fifteen, at fifty-five. His picture appears in the top left quadrant, above and to the left of an even older man, Linus Pauling, age fifty-nine, pictured in the lower middle. The two men helped transform periodic table chemistry, and though not intimate friends, conversed about and exchanged letters on topics of mutual interest. Segre once wrote Pauling for advice on experiments with radioactive beryllium. Pauling later asked Segre about the provisional name for element 87, Francium, which Segre had co-discovered and Pauling wanted to mention in an Encyclopedia Britannical article he was writing on the periodic table. What's more, they could easily have been, in fact, should have been, faculty colleagues. In 1922, Pauling was a hot chemistry recruit out of Oregon, and he wrote a letter to Gilbert Lewis, the chemist who kept losing the Nobel Prize, at the University of California at Berkeley, inquiring about graduate school there. Strangely, Lewis didn't bother answering, so Pauling enrolled at the California Institute of Technology, where he starred as a student and faculty member until 1981. Only later did Berkeley realize it had lost Pauling's letter. Had Lewis seen it, he certainly would have admitted Pauling, and then, given Lewis's policy of keeping top graduate students as faculty members, 
would have bound Pauling to Berkeley for life. Later, Segre would have joined Pauling there. In 1938, Segre became yet another Jewish refugee from fascist Europe when Benito Mussolini bowed to Hitler and sacked all the Jewish professors in Italy. As bad as that was, the circumstances of Segre's appointment at Berkeley proved equally humiliating. At the time of his firing, Segre was on sabbatical at the Berkeley Radiation Lab, a famed cousin of the chemistry department. Suddenly homeless and scared, Segre begged the director of the Rad Lab for a full-time job. The director said yes, of course, but only at a lower salary. He assumed correctly that Segre had no other options and forced him to accept a 60% pay cut from a handsome $300 per month to 116 Segre bowed his head and accepted, then sent for his family in Italy, wondering how he would support them. Segre got over the slight, and in the next few decades he and Pauling, especially Pauling, became legends in their respective fields. They remain today two of the greatest scientists most laypeople have never heard of. But a largely forgotten link between them, time certainly didn't bring it up, is that Pauling and Segre will forever be united in infamy for making two of the biggest mistakes in science history. Now, mistakes in science don't always lead to baleful results. Vulcanized rubber, Teflon, and penicillin were all mistakes. Camelo Golgi discovered osmium staining, a technique for making the details of neurons visible, after spilling that element onto brain tissue. Even an outright falsehood, the claim of the 16th century scholar and protochemist Paracelsus that mercury, salt, and sulfur were the fundamental atoms of the universe, helped turn alchemists away from a mind-warping quest for gold and usher in real chemical analysis. Serendipitous clumsiness and outright blunders have pushed science ahead all through history. Pauling's and Segre's were not those kinds of mistakes. They were hide-your-eyes, don't-tell-the-provost gaffes. In their defense, both men were working on immensely complicated projects that, though grounded in the chemistry of single atoms, vaulted over that chemistry into explaining how systems of atoms should behave. Then again, both men could have avoided their mistakes by studying a little more carefully the very periodic table they helped illuminate. Speaking of mistakes, no element has been discovered for the first time more times than element 43. It's the Loch Ness Monster of the elemental world. In 1828, a German chemist announced the discovery of the new elements polinium and pluranium, one of which he presumed was element 43. Both turned out to be impure iridium. In 1846, another German discovered Ilmenium, which was actually niobium. The next year, someone else discovered polopium, which was niobium, too. Element 43 disciples at last got some good news in 1869, when Mendeleev constructed his periodic table and left a tantalizing gap between 42 and 44. However, though good science itself, Mendeleev's work encouraged a lot of bad science since it convinced people to look for something they were predisposed to find. Sure enough, eight years later, one of Mendeleev's fellow Russians inked Davium into box 43 on the table, even though it weighed 50% more than it should have and was later determined to be a mix of three elements. Finally, in 1896, Lucium was discovered and discarded as Yttrium, just in time for the 20th century. The new century proved even crueler. In 1909, Masataka Ogawa discovered Nipponium, which he named for his homeland, Nippon in Japanese. All the previous faux 43s had been contaminated samples or previously discovered trace elements. Ogawa had actually discovered a new element, just not what he claimed. In his rush to seize element 43, he ignored other gaps in the table and when no one could confirm his work, he retracted it, ashamed. Only in 2004 did a countryman re-examine Ogawa's data and determine he had isolated element 75, rhenium, also undiscovered at the time, without knowing it. 
It depends whether you're a half-full or half-empty kind of person if you think Ogawa would be posthumously pleased to find out he'd discovered at least something, or even more vexed at his wrenching mistake. Element 75 was discovered unambiguously in 1925 by three more German chemists, Otto Berg and the husband-and-wife team of Walter and Ida Nodek. They named it Rhenium after the Rhine River. Simultaneously, they announced yet another stab at Element 43, which they called Masurium, after a region in Prussia. Given that nationalism had destroyed Europe a decade earlier, other scientists did not look kindly on these Teutonic, even jingoistic names. Both the Rhine and Masuria had been sites of German victories in World War I. A continent-wide plot rose up to discredit the Germans. The Rhenium data looked solid, so scientists concentrated on the sketchier Masurium work. According to some modern scholars, the Germans might have discovered Element 43. But the trio's paper contained sloppy mistakes, such as overestimating by many thousands of times the amount of Masurium they had isolated. As a result, scientists already suspicious of yet another claim for Element 43 declared the finding invalid. Only in 1937 did two Italians isolate the element. To do so, Emilio Segre and Carlo Perrier took advantage of new work in nuclear physics. Element 43 had proved so elusive until then because virtually every atom of it in the Earth's crust had disintegrated radioactively into molybdenum, element 42, millions of years ago. So instead of sifting through tons of ore like suckers for a few micro-ounces of it, as Berg and the Nautics had, the Italians had an unknowing American colleague make some. A few years earlier, that American, Ernest Lawrence, who once called Berg and the Nautics' claim for Element 43 delusional, had invented an atom smasher called a cyclotron to mass-produce radioactive elements. Lawrence was more interested in creating isotopes of existing elements than in creating new ones. But when Segre happened to visit Lawrence's lab on a tour of America in 1937, Segre heard that the cyclotron used replaceable molybdenum parts, at which point his internal Geiger counter went wild. He cagily asked to look at some discarded scraps. Weeks later, at Segre's request, Lawrence happily flew a few worn-out molybdenum strips to Italy in an envelope. Segre's hunch proved correct. On the strips, he and Perrier found traces of Element 43. They had filled the periodic table's most frustrating gap. Naturally, the German chemists did not abandon their claim for Masurium. Walter Nautic even visited and quarreled with Segre in the Italian's office, and did so dressed in an intimidating quasi-military uniform covered with swastikas. This didn't endear him to the short, volatile Segre, who also faced political pressure on another matter. Officials at the University of Palermo, where Segre worked, were pushing him to name his new element Panormium, after the Latin for Palermo. Perhaps wary because of the nationalistic debate over Masurium, Segre and Perrier chose Technetium, Greek for artificial, instead. It was fitting, if dull, since Technetium was the first man-made element. But the name cannot have made Segre popular, and in 1938 he arranged for a sabbatical abroad at Berkeley, under Lawrence. There's no evidence Lawrence held a grudge against Segre for his molybdenum gambit but it was Lawrence who lowballed Segre later that year. In fact, Lawrence blurted out, oblivious to the Italian's feelings, how happy he was to save $184 per month to spend on equipment, like his precious cyclotron. Ouch. This was further proof that Lawrence, for all his skill in securing funds and directing research, was obtuse with people. As often as Lawrence recruited one brilliant scientist, his dictatorial style drove another away. Even a booster of his, Glenn Seaborg, once said that Lawrence's world-renowned and much-envied rad lab, and not the Europeans who did, should have discovered artificial radioactivity and nuclear fission, the most momentous discoveries in science at the time. To miss both, Seaborg ruled, was scandalous failure. Still, Segre might have sympathized with Lawrence on that last account. 
Segre had been a top assistant to the legendary Italian physicist Enrico Fermi in 1934, when Fermi reported to the world, wrongly it turned out, that by bombarding uranium samples with neutrons, he had discovered element 93 and other transuranic elements. Fermi long had a reputation as the quickest wit in science, but in this case his snap judgment misled him. In fact, he missed a far more consequential discovery than transuranics. He had actually induced uranium fission years before anyone else, and hadn't realized it. When two German scientists contradicted Fermi's results in 1939, Fermi's whole lab was stunned. He had already won a Nobel Prize for this. Segre felt especially chagrined. His team had been in charge of analyzing and identifying the new elements. Worse, he instantly remembered that he, among others, had read a paper on the possibility of fission in 1934 and had dismissed it as ill-conceived and unfounded. A paper by, of all the damned luck, Ida Nodick. Author's Note Overall, Ida Nodick had a spotty run as a chemist. She helped find Element 75, but her group's work with Element 43 was riddled with mistakes. She predicted nuclear fission years before anyone else, but about that same time she began arguing that the periodic table was a useless relic because the multiplication of new isotopes was rendering it unwieldy. It's not clear why Nautic believed that each isotope was its own element, but she did, and she tried to convince others that they should scrap the periodic system. Segre, who later became a noted science historian, as well as incidentally a noted hunter of wild mushrooms, wrote about the fission mistake in two books, saying the same terse thing both times. Fission escaped us, although it was called specifically to our attention by Ida Nautic, who sent us an article in which she clearly indicated the possibility. The reason for our blindness is not clear. As a historical curiosity, he might also have pointed out that the two women who came closest to discovering fission, Nautic and Irene Joliot Curie, daughter of Marie Curie, and the person who did eventually discover it, Lisa Meitner, were all women. Unfortunately, Segre learned his lesson about the absence of transuranic elements too literally, and he soon had his own solo scandalous failure to account for. Around 1940, scientists assumed that the elements just before and just after uranium were transition metals. According to their arithmetic, element 90 fell in column 4, and the first non-naturally occurring element, 93, fell in column 7 beneath technetium. But as the modern table shows, the elements near uranium are not transition metals. They sit beneath the rare earths at the bottom of the table and act like rare earths, not like technetium, in chemical reactions. The reason for chemists' blindness back then is clear. Despite their homage to the periodic table, they didn't take periodicity seriously enough. They thought the rare earths were strange exceptions, whose quirky, clingy chemistry would never repeat. But it does repeat. Uranium and others bury electrons in F-shells just like the rare earths. They must, therefore, jump off the main periodic table at the same point and behave like them in reactions. Simple, at least in retrospect. A year after the bombshell discovery of fission, a colleague down the hall from Segre decided to try again to find element 93, so he irradiated some uranium in the cyclotron. Believing, for the reasons just mentioned, that this new element would act like technetium, he asked Segre for help, since Segre had discovered technetium and knew its chemistry better than anyone. Segre, an eager element hunter, tested the samples. Taking after his quick-witted mentor, Fermi, he announced that they acted like rare earths, not like heavy cousins of technetium. More humdrum nuclear fission, Segre declared, and he dashed off a paper with the glum title An Unsuccessful Search for Transuranic Elements. But while Segre moved on, the colleague, Edwin McMillan, felt troubled. All elements have unique radioactive signatures, and Segre's rare earths had different signatures than the other rare earths, which didn't make sense. After careful reasoning, Macmillan realized that perhaps the samples acted like rare earths, 
because they were chemical cousins of rare earths and diverged from the main periodic table, too. So he and a partner redid the irradiation and chemical tests, cutting Segre out, and they immediately discovered nature's first forbidden element, Neptunium. The irony is too good not to point out. Under Fermi, Segre had misidentified nuclear fission products as transuranics. Apparently not learning from that experience, Glenn Seaborg recalled, once again Segre saw no need to follow up with careful chemistry. In the exact opposite blunder, Segre's sloppily misidentified transuranic neptunium as a fission product. Though no doubt furious with himself as a scientist, perhaps as a science historian, Segre could appreciate what happened next. Macmillan won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1951 for this work, but the Swedish Academy had rewarded Fermi for discovering the transuranic elements, so rather than admit a mistake, it defiantly rewarded Macmillan only for investigating the chemistry of the transuranium elements, emphasis added. Then again, since careful, mistake-free chemistry had led him to the truth, maybe that wasn't a slight. If Segre proved too cocksure for his own good, he was nothing compared to the genius just down I-5 in Southern California, Linus Pauling. After earning his Ph.D. in 1925, Pauling had accepted an 18-month fellowship in Germany, then the center of the scientific universe. Just as all scientists communicate in English today, back then it was de rigueur to speak German. But what Pauling, still in his twenties, learned about quantum mechanics in Europe, soon propelled U.S. chemistry past German chemistry, and himself onto the cover of Time magazine. In short, Pauling figured out how quantum mechanics govern the chemical bonds between atoms. Bond strength, bond length, bond angle, nearly everything. He was the Leonardo of chemistry, the one who, as Leonardo did in drawing humans, got the anatomical details right for the first time. And since chemistry is basically the study of atoms forming and breaking bonds, Pauling single-handedly modernized the sleepy field. He absolutely deserved one of the great scientific compliments ever paid when a colleague said Pauling proved that chemistry could be understood rather than being memorized. Emphasis added. After that triumph, Pauling continued to play with basic chemistry. He soon figured out why snowflakes are six-sided, because of the hexagonal structure of ice. At the same time, Pauling was clearly itching to move beyond straightforward physical chemistry. One of his projects, for instance, determined why sickle cell anemia kills people. The misshaped hemoglobin in their red blood cells cannot hold on to oxygen. This work on hemoglobin stands out as the first time anyone had traced a disease to a malfunctioning molecule, and it transformed how doctors thought of medicine. Author's Note Pauling, with colleagues Harvey Etano, S. Jonathan Singer, and Ibert Wells, determined that defective hemoglobin causes sickle cell anemia by running defective cells through a gel in an electric field. Cells with healthy hemoglobin traveled one way in the electric field, while sickle cells moved in the opposite direction. This meant the two types of molecules had opposite electric charges, a difference that could arise only on a molecular, atom-by-atom -atom level. Funnily enough, Francis Crick later cited the paper in which Pauling laid out his theory about the molecular basis of sickle cell anemia as a major influence on him since it was exactly the sort of nitty-gritty molecular biology that interested Crick. Pauling then, in 1948, while laid up with the flu, decided to revolutionize molecular biology by showing how proteins can form long cylinders called alpha helixes. Protein function depends largely on protein shape, and Pauling was the first to figure out how the individual bits in proteins know what their proper shape is. In all these cases, Pauling's real interest, besides the obvious benefits to medicine, was in how new properties emerge almost miraculously when small, dumb atoms self-assemble into larger structures. The really fascinating angle is that the parts often betray no hint of the whole. Just as you could never guess, unless you'd seen it, that individual carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms 
could run together into something as useful as an amino acid, you'd have no idea that a few amino acids could fold themselves into all the proteins that run a living being. This work, the study of atomic ecosystems, was a step up in sophistication even from creating new elements. But that jump in sophistication also left more room for misinterpretation and mistakes. In the long run, Pauling's easy successes with alpha helixes proved ironic. Had he not blundered with another helical molecule, DNA, he would surely be considered one of the top five scientists ever. Like most others, Pauling was not interested in DNA until 1952, even though Swiss biologist Friedrich Miescher had discovered DNA in 1869. Miescher did so by pouring alcohol and the stomach juice of pigs onto pus-soaked bandages, which local hospitals gladly gave to him, until only a sticky, goopy, grayish substance remained. Upon testing it, Miescher immediately and self-servingly declared that deoxyribonucleic acid would prove important in biology. Unfortunately, chemical analysis showed high levels of phosphorus in it. Back then, proteins were considered the only interesting part of biochemistry, and since proteins contain zero phosphorus, DNA was judged a vestige, a molecular appendix. Author's Note Interestingly, biologists are slowly coming back around to their original view from Miescher's day that proteins are the be-all and end-all of genetic biology. Genes occupied scientists for decades, and they'll never really go away. But scientists now realize that genes cannot account for the amazing complexity of living beings, and that far more is going on. Genomics was important fundamental work but proteomics is where there's real money to be made. Only a dramatic experiment with viruses in 1952 reversed that prejudice. Viruses hijack cells by clamping onto them and then, like inverse mosquitoes, injecting rogue genetic information. But no one knew whether DNA or proteins carried that information. So two geneticists used radioactive tracers to tag both the phosphorus and viruses phosphorus-rich DNA, and the sulfur in their sulfur-rich proteins. When the scientists examined a few hijacked cells, they found that radioactive phosphorus had been injected and passed on, but that the sulfurous proteins had not. Proteins couldn't be the carriers of genetic information. DNA was. Authors note, to be scrupulous, the 1952 virus experiments with sulfur and phosphorus conducted by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase were not the first to prove that DNA carries genetic information. That honor goes to work with bacteria done by Oswald Avery, published in 1944. Although Avery illuminated the true role of DNA, his work was not widely believed at first. People were beginning to accept it by 1952, but only after the Hershey-Chase experiments did people such as Linus Pauling really get involved in DNA work. People often cite Avery and Rosalind Franklin, who unwittingly told Watson and Crick that DNA was a double helix, as prime examples of people who got locked out of Nobel Prizes. That's not quite accurate. Those two scientists never won, but both had died by 1958, and no one won a Nobel Prize for DNA until 1962. Had they still been alive, at least one of them might have shared in the spoils. But what was DNA? Scientists knew a little. It came in long strands, and each strand consisted of a phosphorus sugar backbone, there were also nucleic acids, which stuck out from the backbone like knobs on a spine. But the shape of the strands and how they linked up were mysteries, important mysteries. As Pauling showed with hemoglobin and alpha helixes, shape relates intimately to how molecules work. Soon DNA shape became the consuming question of molecular biology. And Pauling like many others, assumed he was the only one smart enough to answer it. This wasn't, or at least wasn't only, arrogance. Pauling had simply never been beaten before. So in 1952, with a pencil, a slide rule, and sketchy second-hand data, Pauling sat down at his desk in California to crack DNA.
He first decided, incorrectly, that the bulky nucleic acids sat on the outside of each strand. Otherwise he couldn't see how the molecule fit together. He accordingly rotated the phosphorus sugar backbone toward the molecule's core. Pauling also reasoned, using the bad data, that DNA was a triple helix. That's because the bad data was taken from desiccated, dead DNA, which coils up differently than wet, live DNA. The strange coiling made the molecule seem more twisted than it is, bound around itself three times. But on paper, this all seemed plausible. Everything was humming along nicely until Pauling requested that a graduate student check his calculations. The student did, and was soon tying himself in knots trying to see where he was wrong and Pauling was right. Eventually, he pointed out to Pauling that it just didn't seem like the phosphate molecules fit, for an elementary reason. Despite the emphasis in chemistry classes on neutral atoms, sophisticated chemists don't think of elements that way. In nature, especially in biology, many elements exist only as ions, charged atoms. Indeed, according to laws Pauling had helped work out, the phosphorus atoms in DNA would always have a negative charge and would therefore repel each other. He couldn't pack three phosphate strands into DNA's core without blowing the damn thing apart. The graduate student explained this, and Pauling, being Pauling, politely ignored him. It's not clear why Pauling bothered to have someone check him if he wasn't going to listen, but Pauling's reason for ignoring the student is clear. He wanted scientific priority. He wanted every other DNA idea to be considered a knockoff of his, so, contra his usual meticulousness, he assumed the anatomical details of the molecule would work themselves out, and he rushed his phosphorus in triple-stranded model into print in early 1953. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, two gawky graduate students at Cambridge University pored over advanced copies of Pauling's paper. Linus Pauling's son, Peter, worked in the same lab as James Watson and Francis Crick and had provided the paper as a courtesy. The unknown students desperately wanted to solve DNA to make their careers, and what they read in Pauling's paper flabbergasted them. They had built the same model a year before, and had dismissed it, embarrassed when a colleague had shown what a shoddy piece of work their triple helix was. During that dressing down, however, the colleague, Rosalind Franklin, had betrayed a secret. Franklin specialized in X-ray crystallography, which shows the shapes of molecules. Earlier that year, she had examined wet DNA from squid sperm, and calculated the DNA was double-stranded. Pauling, while studying in Germany, had studied crystallography too, and probably would have solved DNA instantly if he'd seen Franklin's good data. His data for dried-out DNA was also from X-ray crystallography. However, as an outspoken liberal, Pauling had had his passport revoked by McCarthyites in the U.S. State Department, and he couldn't travel to England in 1952 for an important conference where he might have heard of Franklin's work. And unlike Franklin, Watson and Crick never shared data with rivals. Instead, they took Franklin's abuse, swallowed their pride, and started working with her ideas. Not long afterward, Watson and Crick saw all their earlier errors reproduced in Pauling's paper. Shaking off their disbelief, they rushed to their advisor, William Bragg. Bragg had won a Nobel Prize decades before, but lately had become bitter about losing out on key discoveries, such as the shape of the Alpha Helix, to Pauling, his flamboyant and, as one historian had it, acerbic and publicity-seeking rival. Bragg had banned Watson and Crick from working on DNA after their triple-stranded embarrassment, but when they showed him Pauling's boners and admitted they'd continued to work in secret, Bragg saw a chance to beat Pauling yet he ordered them back to DNA. First thing, Crick wrote a cagey letter to Pauling asking how that phosphorus core stayed intact, considering Pauling's theory said it was impossible and all. This distracted Pauling with futile calculations. Even while Peter Pauling alerted him that the two students were closing in, 
Pauling insisted his three-stranded model would prove correct, that he almost had it. Knowing that Pauling was stubborn but not stupid and would see his errors soon, Watson and Crick scrambled for ideas. They never ran experiments themselves, just brilliantly interpreted other people's data. And in 1953, they finally wrested the missing clue from another scientist. That man told them that the four nucleic acids in DNA, abbreviated A, C, T, and G, always show up in paired proportions. That is, if a DNA sample is 36% A, it will always be 36% T as well. Always. The same with C and G. From this, Watson and Crick realized that A and T and C and G must pair up inside DNA. Ironically, that scientist had told Pauling the same thing years before on a sea cruise. Pauling, annoyed at his vacation being interrupted by a loudmouth colleague, had blown him off. What's more, miracle of miracles, those two pairs of nucleic acids fit together snugly, like puzzle pieces. This explained why DNA is packed so tightly together— a tightness that invalidated Pauling's main reason for turning the phosphorus inward. So while Pauling struggled with his model, Watson and Crick turned theirs inside out, so the negative phosphorus ions wouldn't touch. This gave them a sort of twisted ladder, the famed double helix. Everything checked out brilliantly. And before Pauling recovered, they published this model in the April 25th 1953 issue of Nature. Author's note. After the DNA debacle, Ava Pauling, Linus's wife, famously scolded him. Assuming that he would decipher DNA, Pauling had not broken much of a sweat on his calculations at first, and Ava lit into him. If DNA was such an important problem, why didn't you work harder at it? Even so, Linus loved her deeply. And perhaps one reason he stayed at Caltech so long and never transferred his allegiance to Berkeley, even though the latter was a much stronger school at the time, was that one of the more prominent members of the Berkeley faculty, Robert Oppenheimer, later head of the Manhattan Project, had tried to seduce Ava, which made Linus furious. So how did Pauling react to the public humiliation of triple helixes and inverted phosphorus, and to losing out to his rival Bragg's lab, no less, on the great biological discovery of the century, with incredible dignity. The same dignity all of us should hope we could summon in a similar situation. Pauling admitted his mistakes, conceded defeat, and even promoted Watson and Crick by inviting them to a professional conference he organized in late 1953. Given his stature, Pauling could afford to be magnanimous. His early championing of the double helix proved he was. The years after 1953 went much better for both Pauling and Segre. In 1955, Segre and yet another Berkeley scientist, Owen Chamberlain, discovered the antiproton. Antiprotons are the mirror image of regular protons. They have a negative charge, may travel backward in time, and, scarily, will annihilate any real matter, such as you or me, on contact. After the prediction in 1928 that antimatter exists, one type of antimatter, the antielectron, or positron, was quickly and easily discovered in 1932. Yet the antiproton proved to be the elusive technetium of the particle physics world. The fact that Segre tracked it down after years of false starts and dubious claims is a testament to his persistence. That's why, four years later, his gaffes forgotten, Segre won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Fittingly, he borrowed Edwin McMillan's white vest for the ceremony. Authors note, as one last punch in the gut, even Segre's Nobel Prize was later tainted by accusations, possibly unfounded, that he stole ideas while designing the experiments to discover the antiproton. Segre and his colleague, Owen Chamberlain, acknowledged working with the combative physicist Oreste Piccioni on methods to focus and guide particle beams with magnets. But they denied that Piccioni's ideas were of much use and didn't list him as an author on a crucial paper. 
Piccioni later helped discover the anti-neutron. After Segre and Chamberlain won the prize in 1959, Piccioni remained bitter about the slight for years and finally filed a $125,000 lawsuit against them in 1972, which a judge threw out not for lack of scientific standing, but because it had been filed more than a decade after the fact. From the New York Times obituary of Piccioni on April 27, 2002. He'd break down your front door and tell you he's got the best idea in the world, said Dr. William A. Wenzel, a senior scientist emeritus at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, who also worked on the anti-neutron experiment. Knowing Arresta, he has a lot of ideas. He throws them out a dozen a minute. Some of them are good, some of them aren't. Nevertheless, I felt he was a good physicist, and he contributed to our experiment. After losing out on DNA, Pauling got a consolation prize, an overdue Nobel of his own, in chemistry in 1954. Typically for him, Pauling then branched out into new fields. Frustrated by his chronic colds, he started experimenting on himself by taking mega doses of vitamins. For whatever reason, the doses seemed to cure him, and he excitedly told others. Eventually, his imprimatur as a Nobel Prize winner gave momentum to the nutritional supplement craze still going strong today, including the scientifically dubious notion, sorry, that vitamin C can cure a cold. In addition, Pauling, who had refused to work on the Manhattan Project, became the world's leading anti-nuclear weapons activist, marching in protests and penning books with titles such as No More War. He even won a second surprise Nobel Prize in 1962, the Nobel Peace Prize, becoming the only person to win two unshared Nobels. He did, however, share the stage in Stockholm that year with two laureates in medicine or physiology, James Watson and Francis Crick.